Uh, so um, our next uh, speaker in this uh, morning session um, is uh, Professor Yamima Ben Menachem from the uh, Hebrew University. Um, yes. Um, Yamima was uh, one of my uh, teachers in philosophy of science uh, and uh, preceded me as the direction of the Edelstein Center that is one of the hosts of this event. Um, her uh, research uh, interests are uh, wide, the philosophy of physics, philosophy of science, especially conventionalism, history of science, and uh, American pragmatism. She wrote uh, many papers on these topics. She's the author of uh, the book Conventionalism in Cambridge University Press 2006, the editor of Contemporary Philosophy in Focus, Hilary Putnam, Cambridge University Press 2005, and co-editor with Meichemo of Probability in Physics, uh, Frontiers in uh, Science uh, Series. Um, please, Yamima. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction. Oh, thank you for this introduction. And thank you for inviting me, Oli and Neil, um, to readdress an issue that I talked about about a year ago in this place. And those of you who heard it, I apologize. There are a few changes. So let me begin by, explain, by explaining why the PBR theory is relevant to our discussion of information. So as we know, quantum mechanics is a, a theory in which probability plays a fundamental role. And therefore, questions about the interpretation of probability also figure in attempts to understand quantum mechanics. And the epistemic interpretation of probability, and I think I don't need to explain the term epistemic at this point, um, um, is uh, uh, very popular these days. And uh, the PBR theorem uh, purports to show that the epistemic interpretation of the quantum state and of quantum probabilities is untenable. The epistemic interpretation of the quantum states, of course, represents um, quantum states as states of knowledge or belief or information. And we can immediately ask, how are we to complete this sentence? What is this knowledge or belief or information about? But let me set this question uh, aside for a moment. We'll, of course, return to it because this is a question that uh, is very relevant to understanding the PBR theorem. Um, so the recent PBR theorem purports to show that the epistemic interpretation is untenable, untenable. It is therefore taken to confirm the realist interpretation of the state function, namely, the state function represents the physical state of the system, or is at least a function of this physical state. And it is mostly agreed that this is indeed the conclusion to draw from the theory. And in this talk, I intend to challenge this conclusion. I'm not saying it is completely wrong, but I'm saying there is another very viable option that points in the opposite direction that is undermining a realist interpretation and perhaps supporting an epistemic interpretation. And along the way, I want to clarify a few other points about the interpretation of the quantum state or quantum probability. For example, the difference between the epistemic interpretation of probability in general and the epistemic interpretation of quantum mechanical probabilities or the quantum mechanical state because I think there is a significant difference here that also PBR theorem clarifies. The difference between current epistemic interpretations and other probabilistic interpretations that were already suggested years ago, for example, the ensemble uh, interpretation favored by Einstein. And finally, uh, uh, the difference between the epistemic interpretation of quantum mechanics and instrumentalism, because someone might say, well, the epistemic interpretation is just instrumentalism. So I want to argue that this is not uh, so simple. And so the structure will be as follows. I'll first represent the PBR theorem, 
I then use some history um, to arrive at a better understanding of the issues involved. I thought the historical way is the best way for me to do this. And here my hero is Schrodinger, and it's Einstein versus Schrodinger in understanding quantum mechanical peculiarities. Um, and finally, a very brief discussion of why this isn't instrumentalism. Okay, so the PBR theorem. In their 2012 paper on the reality of the quantum state, Piozzi, Barrett, and Rudolf, and this, this theorem, um, for those of you who are from the other areas that are brought in in these conferences, attracted a lot of attention. So it, it's not that I'm picking on some esoteric uh, recent theorem. Uh, so in this recent paper on the reality of the quantum state, Piozzi, Barrett, and Rudolf summarize a no-go theorem that has come to be known as a PBR theorem. We show that any model in which a quantum state represents mere information about an underlying physical state of the system, and in which systems that are prepared independently have independent physical states, we'll return to this assumption, must make predictions that contradict, contradict those of quantum theory. And this is also how others understand the theorem. So it is generally advertised as undermining the epistemic interpretation. So for example, Scott Aronson was a very well-known and responsible uh, quantum mechanical theorist of quantum information. So under the title Get Real, Scott Aronson announced the new result as follows. Do quantum state, states offer a faithful representation of reality or merely encode a partial knowledge? the partial knowledge of the experimenter. A new theorem illustrates how the latter can lead to a contradiction, contradiction with quantum mechanics. And he elaborates, it is crucial to understand that we're not discussing whether the same wave function can be compatible with multiple states of reality, but a different and less familiar question, whether the same state of reality can be compatible with multiple wave functions. I'll explain that in a minute, or illustrate in a minute. Intuitively, the reason we are interested in this question is that the wave function seems more real if the answer is no, and more statistical if the answer is yes. And the PBR theorem gives the answer no. So these are the two uh, questions that uh, uh, the theorem and, and Aronson distinguish between. The one is a more familiar question whether the same quantum state is compatible with different states of reality. And the other question, and this is the question that uh, the that PBR address, is the question of whether the same state of reality is compatible with these two different quantum states. And let me just mention that this is a very peculiar situation in physics where the same physical state is compatible with two other states which are, well, what are they? So to understand why a negative question, a negative answer to the second question, whether this can happen, whether this is compatible with quantum mechanics, really undermines the epistemic interpretation, we, uh, use, and PBR, in fact, use an analysis given two years earlier in 2010 by Harrigan and Speckens. And Harrigan and Speckens um, make the following distinction. They distinguish between psi-ontic models, where the psi function corresponds to the physical state of the system, and psi-epistemic models, where phi, psi represents knowledge about the system. And consequently, there are also two varieties of incompleteness. Psi would give us partial a partial description of the physical state or partial representat representation of our knowledge about the state. So if we go back here, in the first case, which the PBR theorem does not address, we have one physical state, one quantum state, which is compatible with different physical states. So in that sense, the quantum state is incomplete because um, there are various physical uh, states 
that have the same quantum state. And um, in that case, um, we would think that if the psi ontic model is incomplete, it is conceivable that psi could be supplemented with further parameters. And these are generally known as hidden variables. And in this case, the same psi function could correspond to various physical states of the system distinguishable by means of the values of the additional hidden variables. And psi epistemic <coughs> models can also be complete or incomplete, but we cannot complete them in the same manner. So, so far this is merely terminological. And now they make uh, the following suggestion, that um, they offer a criterion, following criterion, to distinguish psi epistemic models from psi ontological models. If the psi function is understood epistemically, it can stand in a non-functional relation to the physical state of the system. So this was the second uh, uh, question that uh, Aronson distinguished, non-functional relation to the physical state of the system. That is, the same physical state may correspond to two different, two different non-identical but also non-orthogonal psi function. And in the probabilistic case, the distinction is between a case where the supports of the probability distribution do not ov overlap, and the which is the psi ontic model, and the psi epistemic models where it may happen that two functions belonging to uh, two distinct physical states have a positive overlap here on the right. And note, oh, sorry. and. Uh, why do they suggest that this possibility is really a good criterion to identify a, an interpretation as epistemic? Because, and this I think we, you, you refer to the same point, our epistemic change state may change without any change in the physical system. I simply get some more uh, uh, information from somewhere and nothing has changed in the physical state of the system. So that's why they think this is a good criterion for identifying a, an interpretation as epistemic. I think it's the first time that someone really tries to cash out this notion of an epistemic interpretation. And note, regarding the questions that I set aside at the beginning, knowledge, information, belief about what, that here, using this criterion, assumes an answer to the question that we set aside at the beginning, uh, and the answer given is that it is knowledge about the physical state of the system. This is assumed here, and this is what PBR assume, and this is not the only way to understand the epistemic interpretation, as we will see. So the PBR theory makes two assumptions. The first is that the physical has a definite physical state, not necessarily the quantum state itself. And the second one um, that is more controversial, apparently, systems that are prepared independently have independent physical states. Um, and they prove that for distinct quantum states, if there is overlap, we said this was the criterion, that is, if there is, they are to be understood epistemically, the intersection, well, what does it mean there is an overlap? The intersection of the supports is a non-zero measure. measure then they can derive a contradiction with the predictions of quantum mechanics. And they show this first for the very specific case that you see over there, um, and then uh, generalize. And so for the specific case, I'll go over this very, very quickly, just that we'll see what it means. Um, they use two independent preparations of a system, so here they <coughs> use independence. They choose a suitable basis in which it is uh, easy to show what they want to show, uh, and this can be done. Then they suppose, I'm in three now, they suppose that the probability distributions for the two states overlap, the criterion, in a no-zero region delta, and that therefore there is a probability of at least a positive Q to get a physical state from that region in each one of the systems. And then, because of the independent assumption, we, there is a positive probability Q square to get a value from this region for both 
systems. So this is an important step. Then they assume the two, two systems are brought together um, and are now entangled, and their entangled state is measured, and this is also, in principle, possible. And then they show that quantum mechanics gives zero probability to all four orthogonal states onto which such a measurement projects, whereas here we get Q square, which is positive. So we have a contradiction. And then they generalize. Now, we should know that critics who refuse to accept this conclusion justify their position, that is, justify their critique by rejecting the second assumption, the assumption of independence, which may indeed be controversial. Fine and Schlossauer, for example, um, argue against independence. Or there are a few find fault with some other step in the derivation. Critics do not deny, however, that if the theorem were true, it would indeed constitute an argument for a realist interpretation. But of course, we may also question the first assumption, that the system has a definite physical state, and that the quantum state gives us the epistemic probability of that quantum state. In this case, the theorem, if valid, poses a serious difficulty to realist interpretation, therefore supporting rather than undermining the epistemic interpretation of the quantum state. So this is the first part. But I think we, are, we, we want to better understand what is involved in epistemic, probabilistic, ensemble, different ways of understanding quantum probabilities. And as I said, I think the historical way is the best. And it's not just terminological. It's not just what we call uh, epistemic. So the roots of the problem of interpretation go back to the formative years of quantum mechanics when it was realized that the wave function cannot represent an ordinary three-dimensional wave as Schrodinger had initially thought. And born when he suggested the probabilistic interpretation as early as in 90, uh, 1926, um, he already diagnosed the curious character of psi under his interpretation, that is, under the probabilistic interpretation. Because although particles follow probabilistic laws, the probability itself transformed, he says, in accordance with the causal principle, i.e. deterministically. Deterministically is also his term. Uh, and, uh, sorry, furthermore, quantum mechanics only answers well-posed statistical questions and remains silent about the individual process. Born, therefore, characterized the theory as a peculiar blend of mechanics and statistics, an eigenartige Verschmelzung uh, of the two. Now, this formulation is almost identical to that given by Janus uh, years later and quoted by PBR in their paper. He says our present quantum mechanical formalism is a peculiar mixture uh, describing in part realities of nature, in part incomplete human information about nature, all scrambled up by Heisenberg and Bohr into an omelet that nobody has, been, has uh, seen how to unscramble. I think this is what PBR tried to do, to, in a way, to unscramble the omelet. Now, the majority of quantum physicists were willing to tolerate this paradoxical situation, and the question of whether the concept of probability itself can sustain such a strange mixture of being probabilistic but being applicable to the individual system as a physical theory, whether the notion of probability can sustain such a situation uh, was left hanging in midair. But a number of physicists, including Einstein, a dissident minority, preferred to bite the bullet and understand quantum mechanics as a full-blown probabilistic theory. That is a statistical description of an ensemble of systems. And hence, the immediate analogy with statistical mechanics, a theory that indeed holds a promise for peaceful coexistence between two levels, both of them are physical levels, but one is in terms of statistics about the states <laughs> of the other level. So there would be a more fundamental level than quantum mechanics, um, and quantum mechanics would somehow give us probabilities related to this more fundamental level, and this was what Einstein, at least for a certain while, was hoping. 
Um, so proponents of the ensemble interpretation regarded the analogy with statistical mechanics as promising sought to demonstrate the incompleteness of quantum mechanics and the feasibility of a more fundamental level that gives rise to quantum phenomena and explain them. This is a famous search for hidden variables. Now, the ensemble interpretation, should we see it as objective or epistemic? Um, at this point, the subjective probability of pro the subjective interpretation of probability in general and of quantum mechanics in particular was not yet very popular. And in any case, it didn't matter. It didn't matter whether we view statistical mechanics probabilities um, epistemically or realistically, um, um, it did not seem to make an empirical difference, only a conceptual one, just as it makes no difference in statistical mechanics. I mean, the, the predictions would be the same. And nonetheless, the difference becomes significant in the context of quantum mechanics and the PBR uh, theorem. So what is the great merit of the ensemble interpretation? The great merit of the ensemble interpretation is that we do not face the problem of a collapse. Because naturally, the probability of a flipped coin is 0.5. Then we flip the coin. It's either heads or tails. Nobody talks about the collapse as a physical process here. So either on the objective ensemble interpretation or the subjective ensemble interpretation or any other epistemic interpretation, collapse is a, is a great game. In, in, in this interpretation. But there are, also, there are also difficulties. The first one is superpositions and other wave-like effects. These had a very intuitive understanding under the wave interpretation, but under the probabilistic interpretation, and in particular under the ensemble interpretation, they seem very weird. I think it was David Finkelstein who once said that um, getting an interference pattern from these probabilities is like getting wet from the probability of rain. So it's a strange situation. Entanglement is, is strange. Guy um, Chetzroni, where are you, Guy? Works on the meaning of the phase in quantum mechanics. If you think of it, the very meaningfulness of the phase in quantum mechanics is problematic in a theory that also that only looks at the probabilities. Um, because the phase, when you calculate the probabilities, the phase doesn't matter. And so, but the phase does have a real significance in quantum mechanics, in the periodicities that we have, in effects like the bohm aronov effect. So I think this is a, a guy's work is very important in this sense, clarifying the, the one aspect in which this work is important, clarifying the meaning of the phase. The other question, which is even more serious, because it has empirical uh, import, is the status of the uncertainty relations. What are these uncertainty relations? Under the ensemble interpretation, they just apply to ensembles. That is, they, they are some limitation on the dispersion of the ensemble, on the, on, on the, on the distribution, on probability distribution in the ensemble. They say nothing, absolutely nothing, what, about what happens in the individual system. So the individual system, according to the ensemble interpretation, can have definite values of all spin, spin in all directions of position and momentum. Everything is fine with the individual system, no uncertainty relations. And of course, the Copenhagen interpretation and most physicists <coughs> would not agree uh, to that kind of inter interpretation. And then, in early thought experiments, Heisenberg demonstrated that uh, there is an effect known as disturbance. And again, I, I Olympia touched on that uh, effect in quantum mechanics. You make a measurement, the previous state disappeared in a mysterious way. What, what should we make of disturbance? Under the ensemble interpretation, there should be no disturbance. The thought experiments and the usual interpretation, the orthodox interpretation, uh, think of disturbance as a real and troublesome phenomena. So, what are we to make of this? So these are problems. With the pros and cons of the ensemble interpretation in mind, we can return to the controversial analogy with uh, statistical mechanics. So in statistical mechanics, we have the micro level, we have the macro level. In some cases, the relation between macro variables and micro variables is very straightforward, just a kind of average, like in the case of temperature, 
So we have all these molecules b bouncing around at the micro level. They have kinetic energy. There is an average in this kinetic energy, and we get to the m macro level uh, to temperature. The other variables where the relation is much more problematic, like entropy, because no single molecule has, an ocean, has, has a property that is entropy. Entropy is only the number of microstates that correspond to a certain microstate, so it's a different a kind of relation between the micro and macro. But nonetheless, even with regard to entropy, for each microstate, there is a definite answer to the question of whether it belongs to a certain macrostate. That is, whether it has a particular entropy. For all macrostates, and once they are properly defined, the relation between microstates and macrostate is functional. Each microstate belongs to a single macrostate. Not so in the reverse direction. Typically, the same macrostate is multiply realized, my apologies, <laughs> <laughs> by numerous microstates. And since philosophers call this relation supervenience, we can say that even in statistical mechanics, macrostates supervene on microstates. And this was a relation um, raised by the PBR theorem, right? It was, it was a completely different situation where the quantum state does not supervene on the real physical state of the system whose existence PBR <coughs> assumed. They asked whether the real physical state of the system is compatible with two different quantum states. That is, the quantum state will not supervene on the, on the physical state. So it's a very different situation than the situation in statistical mechanics. Um, and in statistical mechanics, we said there is no difference between the ensemble interpretation and the epistemic interpretation. By contrast, in the case of quantum mechanics, the epistemic interpretation departs from earlier ensemble interpretations not only with regard to the meaning of the concept of probability, which is a conceptual problem, but also with regard to the meaning of, of quantum mechanics. The earlier ensemble interpretation is classical. As we said, uncertainty, for example, does not apply to the individual system. The epistemic interpretation need not be. It can take these limitations as fundamental. The epistemic interpretation could, for example, be taken to express an upper bound on the amount of information that one could assess about the individual system. If this is how we understand the epistemic probabilities of quantum mechanics, and I think this is how epistemic theories nowadays understand them, they do not represent contingent or subjective ignorance, what I know about the system, what you know about the system, it is principled ignorance dictated by the situation and by the laws of quantum mechanics. So they do not merely represent epistemic status, but constrain epistemic states. And it is still ambiguous about no, the knowledge about wh what question, but again, the PBR want to disambiguate this question and um, say it is knowledge about the state of the system. Now, ironically, how am I doing? Um, how much time do I have? have uh, more than 10 minutes. Good, maybe I need 13. <laughs> <laughs> ironically, I'm joking. Ironically, it was Schrodinger first exposed the flaws of the analogy between quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics and who made decisive steps towards an epistemic interpretation of the quantum state, even if not under that name. That is, he never said this is an epistemic interpretation, but the negative side, what it is not, is very clear in Schrodinger. So according to Schrodinger, the psi function does not represent an existing physical state, but a maximal catalog of possible measurements. This is very similar to a formulation that Itamar Pitovsky gave as a bookkeeping device it embodies a momentarily attained sum of theoretically based future expectation, somewhat as laid down in the catalog. It is a determinacy bridge between measurements and measurements. Um, so the Schrodinger and later quantum 
uh, epistemic theorists, do not think of the quantum state as representing classical ignorance, but rather a constraint on information that characterizes quantum mechanics. And Schrodinger was also explicit about the non-classical nature of quantum probability. Again, a feature that Itamar Pitovsky is very known for, independently of Schrodinger. I did not know Schrodinger at the time. And he says, Schrodinger says, it's not a matter of the dynamics of the system. And it's a fundamental problem resulting from the structure of quantum mechanics. And even in a single moment, I cannot assign quantum classical probabilities to quantum states. So he says, uh, if I wish to assign to a model at each moment a definite, merely not exactly known to me, state, or to all determining parts, definite, merely not exactly known to me, numerical values, there then is no supposition as to these numerical values to be imagined. That is, it's not, uncertainty is not about not measuring or not preparing. The very assignment of definite values will lead to contradiction that would not conflict with some portion of quantum mechanics. <laughs> Note that this is 35. I think it's really amazing that he has not been listened to at all at the time. Consequently, Schrodinger takes the uncertainty relation to constitute a fundamental limitation on the assignment of values to physical magnitudes. I'll skip the following a quote which shows this. And um, he, cert he therefore rules out the possibilities that quantum probabilities only reflect our ignorance about the real state of the system and sees the limit as fundamental. Now, the maximality or completeness of the catalog, and this is important for entanglement and for the PBR theorem, entails that we cannot have a more complete catalog. For example, there can be no two, two psi functions of the same system, one of which is included in the, in the other. Therefore, if a system changes, whether by itself or because of measurement, there must always be statements missing from the new function that were contained in the earlier one. That is, we have disturbance. Um, and this understanding, again, I, I skip one quotation. This understanding is strikingly similar to that emerging from Speck and Stoy model, which is a 200 and something model, where disturbance is derived from the knowledge balance principle that is, again, analogous to what Schrodinger said, only half of the parameters can give can be given definite values. In the knowledge principle, the amount of knowledge is equal to the amount of uncertainty. Um, so again, there is an analogy there. And Schrodinger, who was the first to identify entanglement, argued that this quantum phenomena also follows from the maximality or completeness of the psi function. A complete catalog for two separate systems, and now think of the EPR situation with the two separate systems is ipso facto also a complete catalog of the combined system, the entangled system. But the reverse does not follow. Why? Because maximum knowledge of a total system does not necessarily include total knowledge of all its parts, not even with these are f when these are fully separated from each other and at the moment are not influencing each other at all. Hence the worry about compatibility with a special theory of relativity. And the reason we cannot infer such total information is that the maximal catalog of the combined system may contain conditional statements of the form if a measurement on the first system yields a value x, a measurement on the second will yield the value y, and so on. And this is, again, very much related to your description of teleportation transmission of quantum information. There are conditional statements there. So Schrodinger sums up, best possible knowledge of a whole does not necessarily include the same of its parts. The whole is in a definite state. The parts taken individually are not. In other words, separated systems can be correlated or entangled via the psi function of the combined system, but this does not mean that their individual states are already determined. Now, obviously, written in 35, right after the EPR uh, paper was published. Um, Schrodinger takes this to be a very elegant critique of Einstein and the EPR argument. He doesn't say so explicitly, but it's obviously um, 
a, a critique of Einstein, and it's interesting because he's usually conceived an ally of Einstein. So the EPR argument purports to show that the correlations between the remote parts of the system, the conditional statements, entail that each individual state already had a determinate value prior to measurement. By contrast, Schrodinger argues first that such determinacy is precluded by the uncertainty relations properly understood, and second that given his reading of the psi function as a maximal catalog of possible measurements, the indeterminacy of the individual outcomes makes perfect sense. So here there is a very fundamental difference between Einstein and Schrodinger and it goes back to an ensemble interpretation versus an epistemic interpretation, and it has real empirical import, which was only tested in later years. So here, I don't need to review this. Uh, later years uh, brought a, a great progress beyond the status quo that was there at the time of Bohr, Einstein, and Schrodinger. There, were Bell, there are Bell inequalities, there is the quotient specker theorem, the Clauser-Horn-Shimoni-Holt theorem, all of which uh, pose grave difficulties on the possibility of a definite quantum state prior to measurement. I mean, we can still uh, have interpretations that ascribe a definite quantum state to the quantum system, but these are cases that uh, make this more problematic than um, proponents of the ensemble interpretation and those who made the analogy with statistical mechanics uh, had thought before. So what do we do? Do we adopt an epistemic interpretation? So the epistemic interpretation has not yet succeeded in recovering quantum mechanics uh, completely. There is a very nice toy model by Speckens, and it has recovered many of the characteristics of quantum mechanics, but not full-blown quantum mechanics. And there are other uh, formalizations of quantum mechanics on the epistemic view, including, again, uh, some of the uh, Itamar, Itamar and Jeffrey Babb, um, others at the Perimeter Institute, they are all epistemic theorists. Um, but they assume the Hilbert space, they assume a much more elaborate apparatus. Um, so these are the two options, and these are the, this is the option that the PBR uh, um, theory disambiguates. Their decision is we have ruled out the epistemic interpretation. I'm saying um, there is the other option of ruling, of, of not accepting the idea of a definite physical state, um, and not accepting this peculiar criterion of another level that does not even supervene on your previous level, and understanding quantum uh, uh, probabilities in that way would make them completely subjective, and I don't think this is how we should understand quantum probabilities. So PBR, they say somewhere at the beginning of the paper, there is this other option. They don't ig ignore it completely, but they say, well, this is instrumentalism, so instrumentalists shouldn't worry about our theory. But it's not exactly instrumentalism either, because um, instrumentalism is usually motivated by a verification, verificationist theory of meaning, which means that only the empirically testable is meaningful. Hence, the instrumentalist refuses to commit herself to a theoretical or explanatory structure that is not directly observable or testable. So atoms before they were testable were denied by instrumentalists and genes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But precisely because of this restriction, the verificationists or instrumentalists will never get in conflict, will not be able to contradict assertions about such a theoretical structure. For example, if I'm an instrumentalist about properties or a verificationist about properties, and I think about someone in the past, Julius Caesar, and I'm asking myself whether he liked a certain kind of music or had absolute pitch or carried a certain gene or whatever, and assume that we will never have evidence that answers this question. 
So obviously, if I decide to think of Julius Caesar portraying him as someone who had absolute pitch, I would not get in conflict with the empirical data. That was the assumption. That's why the instrumentalist said there is no fact of the matter way, whether he carried this gene. But in the case of quantum mechanics, the situation is completely different. We do get in conflict, as we saw, if we assign definite values. This is what Bell showed. So the very assignment of values leads into conflict. So this is a very different situation than in instrumentalism. So for similar reasons, the harrigan Peckins criteria for a model being epistemic, the criterion employed in the PBR theorem is problematic. Quantum state do not represent subjective degrees of belief that are completely unconstrained by quantum mechanics. Rather, they represent maximal degrees of knowledge or belief that are allowed by quantum mechanics. And finally, even we, if we assume with PBR that there is a definite physical state of the system, sanctioning the non-functional relation between the physical state and the epistemic quantum state diverges from the relation between the physical state and the epistemic state in statistical mechanics and makes the epistemic state subjective in a much more radical way. So my conclusion is the following, that for these reasons, all the difficulties with the realist interpretation, we may decline the PBR assumption of definite physical states as well as their criterion for a model being epistemic. Indeed, it is by making these assumptions that PBR get a conflict with the predictions of quantum mechanics. So if I'm right, there is this option of questioning these assumptions, and then the PBR theorem, <coughs> rather than supporting a realist interpretation of the state function, provides another argument against it. And in so doing, it deals a blow, another blow, to the analogy with statistical mechanics. Thank you. I'd like to ask um, what relation this would have with uh, the arrow of time, you know, the ideas of Hugh Price. So if we accept those ideas, probably the state that you're talking about would not be determined merely by its preparation, but would depend on which measurements are going to be made on it, and it would affect the discussion. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I refer you to Daniel. Um, I don't think this is a t today's talk of Daniel, but Daniel, Daniel uh, has a lot to say about uh, price interpretation and uh, thinks it's a good direction to think in. Um, look, I don't answer your question directly, but I say the following. I, it was very difficult to me um, to accept the line of argument that I've presented here. Because at the beginning, when I first heard of the PBR theorem, and wow, here's an argument against the epistemic interpretation, and we all go realist again, and wonderful. And then I thought, no, but there, it's not fair. There are two assumptions here. We can question the assumption of realism just as well. So this is the argument I gave here. Now, the same is true about other difficulties, Bell, Bell's inequalities, for example. So. To me, it seems that they pose a very serious difficulty to a realist interpretation of the quantum state. But someone else can say, no, you can have a quantum state, but you have to accept that it behaves in a very non-classical way. That is, you have non-locality. So there are options to change our physics in order to accommodate real quantum states that still obey quantum mechanics. They have to be non-local, or they go backwards in time, or we, we uh, are willing to get in conflict with special relativity, or there are physical ways. All I was saying is, and if I didn't formulate this clearly, then let me correct it now. I'm not saying realism is ruled out. I'm only saying advertising this theorem as dealing the death blow to 
the epistemic interpretation is a misrepresentation of the theorem because there is this other option in which it strengthens a non-realist interpretation. So yes, there are these options of, of, of having a physical situation, including prices option. <coughs> it's actually a continuation of the previous question uh, and a historical one and for you to elucidate, if you can, uh, how Einstein interpreted the statistical mechanics. In 1931, Einstein, Podolsky, and Tolman raise a big objection to quantum mechanics by virtue of the fact that quantum mechanics does not retrodict. It only can predict. So the question is, in some sense, this analogy between classical and statistical mechanics has a similarity. Classical mechanics is time reversible and you want all of this. The statistical mechanics in its generalized sense is to account for irreversibility. And so uh, the same people, like Podolsky is once again involved in 1935 in terms of EPR and is forgotten. And there it's more again the relationship between how do you explain the non-retrodiction of quantum mechanics and the necessity of it's an argument with Bohr, the necessity of why you need the classical element at the end for the measurement, etc. So the question comes back, uh, this issue of time and predictability, which is always in the future, uh, the classical element allows you to predict and go forwards, etc. but there is something very definite about it. Yeah. Well, so first, thank you for bringing up the earlier episode. And second, um, in what I said, I w was trying to emphasize the difference between the two cases, statistical mechanics versus classical mechanics and quantum mechanics versus a hypothetical underlying quantum state as the people who support this idea have it. So, so uh, as I said, I don't think it is analogous. And I don't think the uh, problem of time is analogous either. In, if anything, there are attempts to erase time completely or the direction of time completely in, in quantum mechanics. Not only these recent, uh, uh, like Price, but also Feynman diagrams, whatever. So I think the problems are different, and I haven't thought of them um, in any depth the problem of time in quantum mechanics, so I don't want to commit myself here. You know, just may I'm not in, as we say in Hebrew. Um, yes, may I please? Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a question. Uh, I agree. Uh, thank you for, uh, I think that the talk was very nice. And, uh, thank you. And, and illuminating, actually, from a philosophical point of view. Uh, and so I agree that there is a uh, that the route that you are uh, uh, raising here is 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 possible, but I just want to. I mean, it it is. It seems to be though very strange to go in this way. I mean, to understand the theorem as as you want as you propose, because and and this is maybe something that we could uh, uh, you know. Any, anyone who wants to view quantum mechanics as a theory of, of, of subjective probability, which is, which is the, the route that you're taking here, uh, you can do it logically, as you showed, but then the view that comes out of that is that there is some, there, there are some sort of, there is some constraint, overall constraint on, on how we can assign the subjective uh, degrees of belief, but there is absolutely no physical, no physical grounding for that. So this is not, it, it, I mean, even if, even if people could show that you could update the subjective probabilities in the, if you do it in the right way, then you could, then you could arrive at, at the right 
relative frequencies of what we see in a sort of a Bayesian way, and, and, and this is what people are trying to do in this approach. Still, the big question, a mystery remains. That is, we have, a, we have a sort of a consistency proof here. Yeah, it's possible to understand the theory like that, but it doesn't seem to... We don't understand from the physics now the, the, you know, how it is that the constraints are as they are. Yeah. So that's the... Oh, I agree with you. I agree with you that to think that the world somehow... No, oh, let me say first something else. I, I, once you view the situation as I described it, the term subjective probability is not the right term. And I think it confuses us even further. It's not subjective probability that the quantum state gives us. The quantum state constrained, constrained um, states of information or transmission of information if we talk about no cloning and theorems like that. So the, it's a peculiar kind of constraint. In one sense we already know of such a constraint, no signaling, because we no longer think of um, no action at a distance in a physical state. We just say, we say as long as we have no signaling, it's a right or right to have correlation, etc. So we have no signaling, and we have these other constraints: the, the knowledge balance uh, principle, or whatever epistemic constraints. So it's strange, but it's a possibility. I agree with you that it's a very unsatisfactory situation where you don't have the physical underpinning, uh, underpinnings of these epistemic constraints. Um, but, but I don't think the other camp are in such wonderful shape either, if you look at the different interpretations. Those who want physical constraints from bomb to many worlds, they are all physical. <laughs> but, so. Yes, Mark. Um, yeah, thank you very much indeed for the talk. Um, this is, uh, I was just wondering if you could help someone coming to this debate from the outside, um, just thinking about how it, um, the position that you're describing maps onto the kind of uh, traditional um, characterizations or interpretations of, the, of, of how you interpret probabilities when they appear in, in physical theories. So the, so the realist option is that um, um, there are frequency. objective chances, something like objective chances out there. Even frequency uh, would even be realist in that sense, sure. with its problems. And the, the, what you were labeling the epistemic option corresponds to something like interpreting the probabilities as degrees of belief or credences. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering, there's, a, there's kind of the third option, which is often canvassed, which is that you interpret the probabilities as describing evidential relations. Um, so this is a, a evidential, or it's sometimes also called an epistemic interpretation of the, of the probability calculus. And in that case, you're not committed to credences you're not committed to objective chances. So whether uh, one proposition yields uh, probabilistic support for another proposition is a purely objective matter of fact. Um, so is the position that you're describing. So, so probability theory is part of logic. The third option of rational. It's probability as an extension of logic. Well, it, it it's not physical, it, and it's not. It describes evidential relations. Yeah. In this case, you predicate the probabilities yeah. usually of pairs of propositions. Yeah, like karma. And you're talking about conditional probabilities. And in that case, yeah. you know, you're describing yeah. objective support relations between them. Yeah. Um, again, I did not go into different interpretations of probability in general in this talk. And I didn't want to take sides on them in general. But um, I think a kind of um, here is a formalism and we look at the different applications is a good starting point. But then there are specific questions, let's say, about frequency interpretation. There are questions about the Bayesian interpretation and particular applications of them. And I didn't go into these questions at all. But what I noted was that it's very often conceived a purely conceptual problem. What do you mean by probability? And for example, when the subjective interpretation became popular with Savage and Definetti, it was a great merit of their interpretation that it eventually recovered the probabilities that earlier theories of probabilities had. 
right? It, it's a merit of the subjective interpretation that er it finally arrives at the same probabilities. What I try to say here is that the epistemic theorist, properly understood, does not think of quantum mechanics exactly as the ensemble, ensemble theorist thinks of quantum mechanics. Because, for example, she takes the uncertainty relations to apply to the individual system or to constrain any possible knowledge about the individual system and disturbance, etc., etc. So I think the epistemic interpretation of quantum mechanics is different from merely subjective interpretation of probability. And that's why it doesn't recover exactly the same predictions, and not predictions that have been made, but the same interpretation of predictions that has been made as other interpretations. This is why I said to May, I think the term subjective probability here is very misleading. Uh, both in Schrodinger and in Speckens and in Pitovsky and in Bab, these are constraints on maximum knowledge. It's something completely different than subjective probability. Well, I may give a certain probability that you are an honest person and someone else. That's not the case of quantum mechanics. So I think this is a different difference that was important to me and not the other conceptual differences between the different interpretations. So it seems it, it sounded like from what you said that you're in the realm of the third camp where it's describing uh, um, uh, objective limits on what a possible agent could infer given a certain given certain evidence. Yeah, but not as a rational theory in general in daily discourse because mm -hmm. I think quantum mechanics poses specific problems. So here I think this is interpretation. And I'm very happy that in the casino, the subjective and the frequency or whatever converge. It's fine. But I was talking about quantum mechanics. Last time I was in a casino a very long time ago. <laughs> so uh, join me in uh, thanking the speaker again.